moments of ideological radicalization and periods of social movement formation. I mean, that's really what, what you're dealing with uh, if you're talking about struggle in the 21st century as well as trying to understand struggle in the, 20, in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. One last thing, Stott and Lynn, who had been a professor, Gwen is there and that was one of his students, uh, um, at Spelman College in the 1960s would become the director of um, the Freedom School program in, in Mississippi, what we actually formally call the coordinator of the Freedom School program. And, and uh, Stoughton is not simply a historian, but he's also an attorney, and he's also a, a, a labor activist in particular in Youngstown, uh, Ohio, where he lives uh, now. Uh, and Stoughton said something uh, in a forthcoming book, it hasn't been published yet, uh, about what he called guerrilla history as necessary that seems pertinent to this discussion, uh, particularly for those of you who are academics or intending to be academics. And it, it will help grassroots struggle. He says, in the practice of guerrilla history, the insights of non-academic protagonists are considered to be potentially as valuable as those of the historian. Thus, guerrilla history is not a process wherein the poor and oppressed provide poignant facts and a radical academic interprets them. Historical agent and professor of history are understood to be co-workers together mapping out the terrain traveled and the possibility of openings in the mountain ridges ahead. Stoughton Lynn, uh, you need to think about that, um, you know, as I said, as a writer and as somebody very concerned about the history, I've limited my response to your question to mm -hmm. issues of history. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to be discussed, but I'm more interested in sitting back now and hearing you know, about your own thinking and planning for, for the struggle ahead. So thank, thank you. you, thank you. So I'm a firm believer, and I, I kind of go across the country saying this, that the liberation of black people uh, is closely intertwined with the liberation of Latino people. And we know there's lots of overlap there. There are black Latinos, Afro-Latinos, lots in there. And again, I've had the opportunity to see some of the most I think dynamic organizing in this country uh, around young undocumented people. And those, I, I, I personally believe that. And um, I've had the opportunity to be involved in that organizing. And so I want to move to Raina next, because I've, I've seen you in action, personally. And so Raina is a queer Chicago youth organizer, pro-immigrant rights activist, and student at UIC who's majoring in gender and women's studies. And the reason why I, I would like to, for you to talk a bit about what kind of movement do you actually want to see? Given the historical context of this being the 50th anniversary of the Mississippi Freedom Project, Freedom Summer Project, and where you are now and where you're located um, in your work, what, what do you actually, uh, what kind of movement do you seek? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a hard question. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been um, organizing around, uh, around immigrant rights uh, for the last five years. Yeah. One second. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to try to do it with the gum, but it wasn't working. So <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. Okay, so what kind of movement do I want to see? Um, I've been organizing for the last five years. Uh, I was introduced in um, youth organizing, I would say a uh, hybrid of uh, youth organizing and student organizing. And what always struck me was um, this idea of, of movement, right? Like, you know, it, it almost be like um, you go to a meeting, um, you do something and it's like an initiation and then you're in the movement, um, right? So. So I feel like also uh, the way that we talk about movement can be uh, very elitist, um, mm -hmm. right? Uh, who comes in, who is not part of the movement. Um, so in regards to that, I would like to see a movement where 
we expand from a definition um, that uh, just revolves around unity, but also that we talk about the privileges that we all have. Um, I think that one of the struggles in, in, in this, the organizing that I've been doing has been um, around figuring out uh, where allies, um, quotation marks, um, fit in the movement, right? Uh, and I think that it's challenging because we have this broad idea of movement as like everyone included, but then it gets to a point where, you know, identities come in um, and we have to pick and choose. Um, and so I'm all for people that are directly affected being at the forefront of the movement, right? Um, but with, and with that, I think that com comes a, um, a conversation around privilege where we don't focus on how are you going to support me, but rather how do we, how does our privilege fit within the larger context of um, what's happening, uh, both political and in society and all of that. Um, and how do we move forward without having to compromise um, our identities when we talk about allyship. Um, so I also wanna see a movement that you know, um, talks about liberation. Um, this is something that I've been uh, kind of like working, like thinking about in my head. Uh, I think that just as much as we should name the things that are oppressing us, um, we should also talk about the things that we want to, to be liberated, but then liberation means a lot of different things to a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? But then that's, I think that those are questions that, that we have to answer if we're down to do movement building. Um, so, yes, um, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so, I would like to move uh, to Marissa next. Marisa, Marisa next. Uh, Marisa is with the National Day Labor Organizing Network who I've also seen in action, had an you all do amazing work, and oftentimes um, in spaces that many of us and in the movement outside of the immigrant rights movement, outside of the worker justice movement, aren't as familiar with. And so I'm wondering, or and engaged with, I'm wondering for you and your experiences, how do silos show up? And if they do show up, um, what do you want to see changed? And is there an actual like path towards changing that with the ultimate goal of like being involved in the movement that you want to see us have. Cool. You folks hear me okay? Hello, everybody. Um, well, first, I just want to say um, I don't often come to Chicago. This is like, I'll count it as my first official time because I've been a certain distance away from the airport. Mm -hmm. And it's an honor to be here, not only uh, to be here to speak with you all and build with you all, but also to, um, to meet some of the folks and, and see folks in their element um, folks like Reina and folks at Idjo and Documented Illinois. Um, I think that some of the work we've been able to do around immigration enforcement in the last few years would not have been possible had it not been for the trust and the risk and the willingness to, to uh, work with us. These folks in Chicago really have held it down. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanna like re-up that. Um, and I'm gonna hit the point around the silos, but I mean, for me, it was about three years ago. I'm sitting on my mama's porch in Guadalupe, Arizona. It's 99% Yaqui. If you don't know who the Yaquis are, Google it later. <laughs> Chicano, Mexicano, sitting on my porch. It's the day before. It's July 28th. And uh, the day after uh, SB 1070 was going to be implemented into law, and it was sunset, and powder blue sky, that blushes when the sun's going down. Really nice sunsets in Phoenix. There's a lot of bad things, but some good things. You should visit. And I was contemplating, after 10 years of organizing, domestic workers in different cities across the country, gentrification, around gentrification, housing, homelessness, around welfare issues, multiracial, just you name it, I've knocked that door. And I had come home to find myself. There's nothing like 
coming home to organize around. And some of y'all probably have the ability to do that. But I'd been 10 years away from home um, to learn how to organize, because there was no, no political organizing in Arizona that was very strong. And um, was perched on something very different. Um, was perched ready to try to put a foot up Jor Pyle's ass. And the next day, we closed this jail, and we stopped a raid. It was over 80 people arrested. And there was a banner, I think, that foreshadowed where we are now, and it, the banner at the top of that jail that says, you know, we welcome illegal aliens here. And there was a banner that said, new namas, not one more. And I was perched, kind of ready to jump into the immigrant rights movement that honestly, just to be real, it was kind of whack to me <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> After a lot of years of, I mean, a lot of my organizing had been in other sectors, right? Um, and those things about the immigrant rights movement that just didn't quite fit. And so I was particularly excited to step in because of, uh, because I saw the work that Endolan was doing was very locally grounded and it was willing to talk about criminalization. Um, and, and it was trying to do things in a very particular way. Um, so with this question, so still there, right? Um, still there, and so it still sometimes feels weird to be sort of identified in the sort of immigrant rights silo or sector. Um, and I think the fundamental thing, I think the challenge with silos is that it's paralyzing. It's paralyzing in the sense of uh, oftentimes the structures that we're working in are too slow and too weighed down with interests and responsibilities to forces that actually aren't the people we need to be listening to. But there's also, there's also a way where silos, um, I think the other side is that sometimes there's a, when we're talking from the left perspective, there's so many boxes you've got to hit for it to be revolutionary or liberatory that that's paralyzing too. Um, and so to me, I would just offer the simple thing of we must be specific and we must be grounded. And that's about as revolutionary as we can get. If we start there, we'll go places. And I think that's been, um, the, the, the seed that we've really tried to build this campaign around. Um, you know, very quickly, we're facing a problem, record-breaking deportations. 96% um, of the people deported in this country are Latino. Uh, we've seen the devolution of civil federal immigration enforcement brought down to the local level in the hands of police, which we not so affectionately call the polimigra, right? Um, more militarization of the border. Um, and then just the human impact, right? Children who are without their parents, or one of their parents. Um, people who, upon committing a crime and having to face the criminal justice system, then are doubly punished through, through um, immigration. Um, and just the simple feeling of so many people right now today are driving, or walking, or doing any working, or going to school with, with the, that feeling in their stomach, or that feeling that comes up in your throat, because somebody, there's a police officer behind you or someone's looking at you a particular way. And so we're facing a very big problem and we've tried to approach it um, you know, with, with uh, particular strategies. So some of the ways I think that we've tried to do that, um, I like the Talking Heads, my favorite song is um, este, This Must Be The Place. And there's a, there's a there's a lyric that says, feet on the ground, head in the sky. And I think that's what we really tried to do with our work. So one of the building blocks of this campaign has been, we call it el uno por uno, one by one. So we've tried to say, we, we're calling for not one more deportation, which some people think is crazy, mm -hmm. right? And how are we gonna do it? Well, we're fighting one by one. We're fighting because this person doesn't wanna, there's a local case here, Anibal, a day labor, right? People mobilized and fought for, for him to be able to stay. And through that lens, that is, the, that, is the, that is the lens that actually explains it all. What is the cost? What are the conditions? How are people actually getting hemmed up? And then we're gonna beat it. And every time we beat it, that's another person that's, that's gonna be getting into the struggle, their family, and they're ready to go. Um, and so we've coupled like this uno por uno, very bread and butter, that oftentimes people are like, nah, that's too much work. A lot of organizations haven't been willing to take on that tactic, it's a lot of work, right? But it's built, it's built a momentum for us to be able to get to Pennsylvania Avenue to where the President of the United States has to answer about deportations. It's been through the cases like Anibal that have got us there. Um, and we've coupled that with the slogan, not one more, or we're gonna shut down ICE. So it's feet on the ground, head on the sky, practical, 
practical tactics, radical message, or vice versa, right? A little sweet and sour, right? Um, the second thing I think is that we've tried to uh, build this around relationship and trust. We haven't tried to build a coalition. Oftentimes, this is with the silo stuff, right? We build coalitions to check off the boxes. Let's get this group, let's get that group. And they're hollow boxes that get checked off that, that say solidarity, but it's actually not deeply felt. And so as a result, oftentimes those coalitions don't go anywhere because we're too busy structuring the structure and processing the process, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, you're gonna do what you're gonna do, right? So let's instead build relationship, let's build trust. Because if we trust each other, you're going to tell me, nah, I'm not going to do that, right? And then we keep it moving, right? So we've really tried to build what our, our group that we've worked with. We call it the Grupo Duro. So it's like essentially the hard cores. And my formula, don't have a lot of criteria. It's basically political unity, generally, right? Practice, we work together. And ganas. Ganas means like, mm, like I'm ready to go, right? Um, and that's how we built this, this campaign. So we don't have a steering committee, coordinating committee, um, very nuanced, very fluid, because we've been able to need to do what we need to do because we're facing a monster. And we don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources. And so we've gotta be able to move easily. Um, and so I think, you know, we haven't necessarily approached it from this position where we're gonna hit every, every box, right? Um, and we're not interested in, in pursuing intersectionality or diversity for the sake of it. Um, we're trying to win and we're trying to build. Um, three ways we, I would just say we've tried to do that and, and I think we've tried to be able to, to, to approach this from a way that is actually hitting some of those boxes but from a deeper place. So we push back. We push back in the small town meetings, trainings, you know, working with people and oftentimes in the immigrant rights movement, we are not criminals. I'm not a criminal. Okay, well, who is? Right? We push back on that. What's criminal is the system. Let's not talk about dividing each other, right? The second thing is in messaging. Just yesterday, we were like, the delaying, you know, the Obama administration was going to announce, you know, delay, uh, changing, or changing some of the administration policies around deportation. And I was telling my, my colleague, B, B, we've got to be able to say something in the name of day laborers. But I also want to say something that speaks to Ramiro, who did a civil disobedience in Santa Ana, who walked, who strutted to that paddy wagon in stilettos. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to speak to the day labor, and we also need to be speaking to Ramiro, right? And then the third is when we approach communities uh, on a very local level, um, and, and in particular in, in, in regions and places where we have, there's a lot of suspicion, there's a lot of like, Ugh, who are you, national? Ugh. It's like, come in with respect, come in asking questions, come in listening, and, and fill the gap and support what's moving. And so that's how we've been able to build. Um, and so last, lastly, I'll just come back to that question of silos and, and, and like the challenges with the, with the nonprofit structure, but also oftentimes in the left, is I would argue the more specific we are, we may not hit all the boxes and we may not sound in the most grandiose, liberatory, revolutionary language, but when we actually get specific, that's when we're able to find each other, that's when you're able to see how it is that your experience relates to mine, and that is solidarity, that is community, and that is transformative. Because when we actually see our experience reflected in another person's, that it may not manifest the same way, that is the transformation, one by one, that will actually lead to greater and deeper wins that our community will not only be able to benefit from, but that we as people will defend and organize around it and make sure that whatever we win right now, that we will protect it and that it will replicate and ripple on and on and on, hopefully to other issues, other sectors, other places, other times. Thank you. So next I'm going to move to Emory Wright, who is currently the, who serves as the co-director of Project South. And I would uh, love if you could talk a little bit about what the, the work of Project South is and speak to the question of 
there's this idea that I've heard, or not idea, but this belief that there's a particular thing to Southern organizing. Or there's a culture of Southern organizing. And you're doing this in 2014 and in, in many ways in the footsteps of the legacy of what happened in 1964 and prior to that. So what does that mean to your work and the kind of movement that you seek to build or you like to see in the South? Right. Well, greetings, everybody. Um, my name is Emery Wright, and i um, really thrilled. I've been excited um, for this week and, um, and thrilled to be here with you all. Part of the reason I am really was excited to come and, and looking out to the audience and hearing um, the discussions already, what excites me about this space is it really feels like a convergence of freedom dreaming. And, um, and so we have artists and activists and intellectuals, organizers, movement people, all here um, in the room right now um, who don't always get time to talk to each other and, and who are actually here in Chicago, I think at a really, really important time for the social movements in this country. So I, in that regard, I want to really thank and respect, uh, give respect and appreciation to um, Barbara Ransby, to um, Bree McFadden, the planning committee, all the people whose names I might not know um, who, who made this, um, this gathering happen. And um, I also want to bring greetings from Project South and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. That's my home and um, that's where I work. Project South is uh, was founded in 1986, and so um, we've been doing movement work um, primarily in the South um, since that time, and um, we're a membership organization. We, um, so I bring you greetings and respect and, and are speaking to um, try to represent the work of our members, of our partners, and, um, and of all the communities that we're in struggle with. One underlining um, assumption that you know is going to guide everything I say right now is that um, social movements in general are the source of all progress. The thought and the action of social movement is the source of all progressive change, and it's also the potential vehicle that is going to lead to our collective liberation as oppressed people here in this country and globally. And so. Based on that, on that assumption, um, I want to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing um, in the South. And it's true that um, we do see ourselves as part of a legacy and a tradition and, um, and, a, and a historical continuum. And, and the beautiful thing about that is I think that that's true. You know, I'm speaking from limited um, experience, but I think that that's true in every part of the world. There's always a movement history, no matter where we are. We might be here in Chicago. We could be in Boston. We could be in, um, you know, we could be in Juarez, Mexico. Um, there is movement history that we can connect to wherever we are. And multiple movement histories, probably. The sister earlier uh, made a, con a comment about the, the sort of um, that, basically that, that continuum, you know, and how we are, um, how, how part of our ability to see where we are really does require understanding the history of what we're part of. But also, to, to Marisa's point, it's also very important because it offers us that genuine specificity that we need to be connecting to. So for example, um, we see a Southern Freedom Movement um, that um, Charlie Cobb mentioned as having its roots in um, a global anti-colonial, anti-imperialist struggle against the enslavement of African people and the attempted genocide of indigenous people in this hemisphere. And so the, the very first efforts of, um, of movement work in the South were contending with either the realities of slavery or the realities of attempted genocide of native people. And that and so if that is where our our tradition has at least a huge benchmark that we're building from, where where is that stuff playing out today? Where where is the colonial process, you know, today? 
um, has, did it end and, um, or is it still going on? And um, so for us, we are, we, you know, the other part of connecting to a history is you don't get to feel like you're just um, making something up for the first time. You have to struggle with um, some of the contradictions, some of the conflicts, some of the political knots um, that have been done over time. You have to, um, you know, think about um, where do you stand on issues um, as, they're, as they played out before and where are we moving them today. At Project South, um, one of the big things that we're doing right now is um, playing a facilitation role, really, in bringing together forces in the South who are all in struggle in a specific way, in a grounded way, based on whatever the struggle it is they're naming, and, um, and bringing us together to talk about really three elements. And so this process is called the Southern Movement Assembly. And the, the elements we're looking at within the Southern Movement Assembly is movement governance. How do we make decisions as social movements? I know we've heard about uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which we see as a big part of our legacy and, and tradition that we're drawing from. The, uh, the um, COFO, you know, was, was, had an element of movement governance to it. Um, there's, there's history that we can look at in terms of how we govern, how we make decisions, how we democratically, with a radical democratic vision, um, say, regardless of what is being done to us, what is it that we're going to do? What's a, um, what's a strategy we're going to build and how are we going to move that forward? So we've been dealing a lot with movement governance. Um, we've also been dealing a lot with movement communications. And so in terms of a point earlier about a lot of the news is more about what's left out. You know, uh, what is, what, how is this impacting our consciousness and how is this impacting the potential to develop strong social movements? Because another assumption that we're working from is that social movement is always around. It might be very powerful, it might be very organized, or it could be very fragmented and it might not even be self-aware. But it's always there. It's always, it's always possible to regenerate it. And so we don't see what we're doing as trying to copy what's been done in the past or try to um, do over something that's been done before. But just like my fingernail has the ability, no matter how I cut it, it can grow again. And it might not be the same exact you know, nail, but it's drawing from the same source. And so we call that regeneration, and we believe that's part of our struggle right now. How do we regenerate a strong Southern freedom movement today? So movement governance, movement communications. Um, my time is, is over. Um, but um, but um, the last piece I just wanted to say is movement force. So in terms of um, where are the struggles at right now? There is a formerly incarcerated people's movement in the South. It is self-aware, it is multi-state, it is working across a lot of different, what could be termed as intersectional, but they just, it is a feet on the ground, eye in the sky movement that is, is, is rolling in the South right now. There is a queer liberation movement in the South right now. And so these are forces um, that, that can come together, that can talk about how do we govern, how do we connect. Not for, I, I so appreciate the point of there's a lot of empty solidarity, but what does real solidarity look like? And that's not easy. This has been a process we've been working since 2010, but it's drawing on processes we've been working um, over this whole time. So, so excited to be here, so appreciated for everyone being here together and hoping that we can really make this moment, this next few days, a benchmark in the history of how social movements have grown in this country. Thanks. So I, I, I saved, uh, I, I wanted to go to Lena last for a couple of reasons. Uh, Lena is one of the folks on this uh, panel who actually focuses her work on doing solidarity uh, internationally, solidarity work internationally. And so I've heard quite a few pieces around doing our work in an anti-imperialist fashion, anti-colonial fashion. Um, those are a lot, those are big words and lots of syllables, right? 
Um, so the question that I want to ask you is around what does solidarity work or cross, uh, cross, cross border work, cross country work look like in a fashion um, that is anti-imperialist or anti-colonialist? Is it actually showing up in movement work today? And um, if not, are there recommendations that you have to create, again, the kind of movement that you want to be in? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to also share how honored I am to be sitting next to each of you and also be sharing this space with all of you in the room as well. Um, I think this is a, a beautiful coming together of many peoples of struggle that I feel honored to be a part of. Um, if it's all right, I'm going to probably just use a little bit of an anecdote of how I got started um, as an organizer. Um, uh, I was born on the southwest side of Chicago, Palestinian American, and people presume if you come from a, a family of activists and uh, folks who are part of the liberation struggle of Palestine that you automatically have a political analysis. Um, and I fortunately had the chance to grow up and have the transformative experience of participating in something that was modeled off of Freedom Summer called the Summer Liberation Institute at the Southwest Youth Collaborative on the Southwest Side. Um, I think it was my first year in high school that I had the chance to do that. And the organizers of it, um, one of them, Jeremy Lahoud, who's a brilliant organizer now based in California, who I wish could be here with us because uh, he's really a visionary, um, really modeled um, what you're talking about in terms of how do we build movements that are built and steeped in solidarity. And I think the foundation of that, of how I was able to develop that understanding, was the fact that we were taught um, and practiced uh, and learned the history of each of our struggles, as you were talking about what does it mean to understand the history and the context of where we come from. But more so, which I think everyone alluded to, um, we developed a critical analysis. We were given, and through our experience and our relationships with each other, um, black, Latino, Arab, mostly poor and working class, um, what is a structural and systemic analysis and understanding of what our reality is and how that shares across each of our communities and struggles. And without that foundation of a critical analysis, um, I think it's almost impossible to have a liberatory uh, movement that's steeped in solidarity and liberation. Um, and so from there, I guess, uh, having that analysis that was developed, which did not necessarily come out of the fact that I was the daughter of refugees or had political prisoners in my family who are struggling, but it was an intentional development that was done through popular education, uh, through hip hop, poetry, uh, done in ways in which centered youth and understanding that youth must be at the forefront of every struggle and not just any youth. Um, youth who are not only directly impacted, but understanding the class dynamic of what's happening. So while I'm honored to be in this space with each of you, I'm thinking about how many young people from our streets could be either at this table or be sharing with us in this conversation, whose experiences um, could really, uh, not just their experiences, but their insights to what um, a struggle and liberation could mean. Um, but I. In saying that, I don't want to minimize how essential having a critical analysis is in developing that. And I think that's something that's lacking across the board um, in many of our spaces. Because without that analysis, it's many of our communities, and this is even true on the ground in Palestine, and this is how class comes into play, and the predominance of the NGO industry, um, which has actively worked to, I think, disrupt civil society. And when I say that, I'm talking about how do we have civil society communities um, that have values and principles that are committed to justice and social change beyond the spaces and structures? Um, of course, you know, funding, grants, et cetera. But uh, our movements have to go beyond those organizations. 
we have to have a culture and a society of people that understands and recognizes what is the soul of the society that we live in? What is the soul of a society that strips the citizenship of black folks on the south side of Chicago day in and day out and denies them their humanity by not offering a political language that recognizes the system in which incarcerates them is criminal, not they themselves, and they thus are political prisoners? What does it mean for us to be able to see that the structures of occupation and apartheid in Palestine on the ground are directly tied to the systems and structures of gentrification, of urbanization, which is essentially the same method of ethnic cleansing that you see in places like East Jerusalem. So this analysis, this connection, and this culture of values and principles that connects us through love, through humanity, through our histories as a people. And I mean, for example, now you have food justice movements. When you think about, this is a, this is a small example of you know, the tendency of campaigns versus broad movements. When you think about food justice, folk, black folks in this country and peasants in the Levant have been practicing local farming for centuries. That's nothing new. So how do we connect that to our history so that we can affirm identities of young people to not see or blame themselves for their criminalization and thus can do something to move and shake? Um, so I, I'm sorry if I sidetracked a little bit with that. Um, but. Uh, I think that that has to be the core foundation of any sort of movement and struggle. And that solidarity then must be built in um, a unity that understands each individual's community's issues and needs. Because again, as I recognize that my solidarity and liberation is tied to that of indigenous folks, black folks, Latinos in this country, I also understand structurally the hierarchy of racism in this country. And that the historical context, despite being a refugee and despite US foreign policy directly tying to my exile of Palestine, um, I still have uh, historical privilege, uh, social capital, and economic capital and being an Arab in this country versus not being someone of African descent in this country. Uh, so understanding that hierarchy of oppression, but not undermining that there are connections, not simply in our oppression and that these systems are connected, but also in our love and liberation for family, community, uh, uh, values, principles, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left uh, for this plenary, and I want to give folks in the audience an opportunity to ask questions. Questions. <laughs> Not comments. I know we have a lot of brilliant people in the room, but if you have a question, um, please, please, please come up, or if you're able to stand or not, we can just get the mic. Can we go to the back first, and then we'll come? Yep. Gotcha. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you to the panel. Uh, thank you for your work. And honestly, I know it takes a lot of work to, to make this world a better place, right? So, so thank you very much. Uh, my question is a little comment first, all right? Oh, no. Can we get to your question first? We only have 10 right. minutes, brother. Okay, real quick, real quick. I know that um, I think it's a little unfair to expect for only you to do the work and how to break off these silos. And I want to challenge the audience. What can we do? Right? Because we have academics and the scholars, people who write. What can we do to make those connections, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we cannot expect for just you to do this work. So I challenge the audience, because we know they work hard and it's overwhelming. What can we do as scholars, for people who write, to make these connections with all these movements? Because it needs to be in the air. That's it needs a great to come question. From different angles. So, so that's my question. That's a great question. And I'm going to, if we can get uh, the question back there as well, and we can get them all together. Yep. One moment. One moment. Yep. Yes, I've worked 38 years in the community and I'm from the Rosen community. And my question is, I've been working with the youth and everybody there for 38 years. And I don't, I, how do we get the mobilization and the interest of the stakeholders that will bring our young people to a 
place of interest for this is their very life. I have a burial tomorrow in the morning. So I need to know what match I can strike to light everything up. That's great. So both questions were pretty similar, right? People are, are trying to get a sense of what they can do and specifically what you can do with younger people and stakeholders. So who would like to take a go with that question? Well, just real quick, um, who in this audience would um, want to raise your hand if you're under 24 years old? Word up. Uh, well, big up for that. And um, now, um, I'm saying big up for that in that name because this is something that I'm holding up called the National Student Bill of Rights. It's been developed by high school students um, from different parts of the country. It's primarily being led by high school students. Um, and this summer, there's going to be, um, and we should, um, we should talk, um, the sister who's been working in the community for 38 years, um, if, uh, right after this panel. Um, and there's a sister over here, Ashley Henderson, who's the regional organizer for Project South, who has more information. But um, there are going to be two opportunities for any of y'all who are under 24. Um, it's an open invitation to come to Jackson, Mississippi. Um, we're going to be doing some strategy work this summer um, for the at the um, at the Freedom Summer Conference. There, there's going to be young people. This is a youth-led effort um, who are converging down there to talk about not just the National Student Bill of Rights, which is a broad vision for education justice by young people, but also to talk about um, um, sort of education justice and youth-led movement in the South in general. In Chicago, we just consider up South from, um, from us. And, um, and so Detroit, if you're in the building too. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and so also, um, but uh, even probably more critical is um, coming down to this youth assembly that we're going to be holding in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and that's going to be on July 25th through the 28th. A sister um, who leads the New Jim Crow movement in, um, in Jacksonville, Florida, um, Alita, um, is going to be, um, the New Jim Crow movement rather, is going to be anchoring this Standing Our Ground Week. Sister Song is going to be doing a national um, convergence down there. There's also going to be a youth assembly down there um, to, to develop a plan of action. And so Ashley, for anybody in the crowd, 24 above or under or whatever, could talk to um, her about some of that. And so, you know, I think, um, I, I know that's not a complete answer, but I would love to talk to you more after the panel. And so we're here in Chicago, the Black Youth Project 100, and I would love to connect with you directly. We have a training on Saturday for Black Youth Movement Building, and would love to have some of your young people come if, if that's possible. But as an organizer, one, like, it's the onus not, is not necessarily on you to do that. You have to find other people, other young people, to be involved in that organizing work. And fortunately, we have some good people in Chicago and in this room doing that. So we'd love to talk to you later about that. Anybody else want to answer that? I just want to say a quick note about part of what I was speaking to, and this goes to the framing and language and naming, which is, I think, so much of our struggle in the U.S. because we don't have the same political framework and language for the struggles that a lot of our young people face. And I think a lot of the work that Reina and that Marisa are doing is um, exactly that in many ways. But I think, um, one, starting to, when we lose our young people, because we've lost, I mean, when I think about the numbers here versus, and I hate to do this because it's not a comparison, um, it's all part of the same struggle and structure, but um, I think of this young person, regardless of why they died, um, as a martyr. And I think framing that and honoring that um, for the other young people to say that they, they died for a reason because of who they were and where they came from. Um, and that their spirit and legacy will continue on by using uh, hopefully forms of, whether it's art, um, uh, forms of resistance that affirm other young people in uplifting that, that young person's spirit and legacy um, and in the process can develop a political analysis um, and hopefully mechanisms for how to organize and channel a lot of that pain and trauma and anger, et cetera, um, but also affirm their identities. Thank you. So can I get your question, is there anyone over, uh, and this oh, one person here, we'll do those together. 
Thank you to the panel. I'm Kamaini, coming without the borders from India. And uh, my question to you is that where in India we're having a debate, I mean, we have problem with this whole concept of civil rights. Uh, how do you define civil rights? And we are looking at a larger concept of human rights, like just comparing with India, that like we had an independence movement, you know, and the civil and uncivil world. And secondly, who do we define civil society? Mm. Oh. Who is civil society? Who do you exclude? Yeah. Who do you include? And being a part of various movements in India, the conflict of interest within the movements where the power hierarchy of NGOs is seeping into movements. Mm. So, That's a great question. I would like your That's a big one. I'm sure some folks have written dissertations on that in this room. <laughs> Hello, my name is Lucretia Burtz. I'm from Chicago. Um, I'm 24. Uh, my question is a little not connected. It's about education, kind of getting to what the gentleman was saying back there. Um, what I've noticed, like we're seeing in, I mean, you know, in all these other groups from the past, is that they were attracting like college age students. And this is kind of where movements happen, right, in these institutions. Mm -hmm. But what I think that there's lacking is an education component for, for like middle school, high school students. Like there's this like, like you go to college to get like to to de to to, to re-educate yourself on all those things that have happened before. Like I think that we're losing our kids because we're not educating them quicker and sooner. So like, how do we connect our movements to our public schools or our institutions? Okay. Thank you. So, who would like to? And, and I apologize. We have to wrap this up. So that'll be our. These will be our last questions. Anybody? Well, I, I'll be real, real quick. Uh, first, uh, I know more about Africa than I know about India, but there's similarities. And if you look at the emergence of of civil society in Africa in places like Angola, uh, uh, Congo, uh, and whatnot. You know, that civil society movements really took shape right down on the ground. It's not really something that can be organized or structure outside of that. So, so there was in Angola, for instance, not just dissatisfaction with an extremely corrupt government, but I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. In Angola, there was not only dissatisfaction with an extremely corrupt and venal government, there was also dissatisfaction with the NGOs and their relationship to, to the national entities, mainly American, that the, and to a lesser extent British, and that they were attached to. And, and there were specific incidents, which we don't have nearly enough time to go into, here that, 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 that led to their emergence uh, with such strength that even the Angolan government couldn't ignore them. I don't know whether that, how that's replicated in some other place. The only lesson I draw from it, that civil society is born on the ground in places around the idea of people saying, this is the kind of society we want and this is the action we're prepared to take to get the society that we want. Thank you. I wanted to answer your question, Lucretia. Um, so I think that, um, and we're working together, right? <laughs> um, and I, I ask myself this question when I go into the space where I'm you know, supposed to give a training based on what uh, some probably white person wrote, you know, without really being connected to what's going on on the ground. And so they expect us to teach this material, right, step by step. Um, and as a trainer, I think that one of the things that has been really uh, challenging has been kind of like navigating the, this, the system um, and acknowledging that this is what is giving me access to working with, with these people, right, youth. Um, use in quotation marks. Um, because I think that, yes, I agree that we're, we're losing people, um, we're losing people in terms of getting them involved. Um, but I also think it's, it, part of it is that I don't know that we can, that we can, how do you teach critical thinking? Like, I, I think that people know what's going on, right? They just have different names for, for it. Um, we, we experience it in, in different ways. So, 
the involvement of young people in, in the movement, um, I think is very based upon how they see themselves connected to the larger, you know, fight. Um, and, and in that, it also goes to like, back to the question of, of like, what can people, what can like, the academia do? Um, oftentimes, you're right, like, I had to come to UIC to be able to make the connections that, you know, um, my status as an undocumented person was actually, you know, connected to all these other things like have, that, that are bigger than me, like transnationalism and all of that. And so, but at the same time, like, we can talk about it and I can talk about it, but um, it doesn't do anything um, to talk about theory, um, right? Like, we can sit here and, uh, what's that quote by Fred Hampton? But, you know, uh, theory, it's, theory is cool, but, you know, without action, it ain't shit. Um, something like that, I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> he said it a lot better, um, of course, you know? And so, and so every time that I'm in the classroom and I'm like hearing all this stuff, I'm like, man, it's not that, that we have to separate ourselves um, and say like, how do we teach critical thinking? Like the critical thinking is there, like it's just how do we expand it and how do we find ways to communicate with each other so that we can reach a goal. Um, so that's it. It's okay, fine. No. Um, it's not just about like critical thinking, it's like history. Yeah, history is like, Yeah. So I want to uh, definitely encourage folks, there, there's some other panels coming up or uh, sessions and workshops coming up that will help to address that question. I love to talk to you because I have to push back on that, but we don't have time for that now. <laughs> I could just add a little oh, oh, snippet okay, cool. to that. Um, I would argue, I would argue that, that uh, our, our young people, our children are being educated um, and, and that is because they're living it. Mm -hmm. um, we, are, we have, we have uh, at least speaking from some of the particular issues that you know, I've been working on, we have children who are facing this every day and they deeply understand the cost, the impact, what it looks like, what it feels like. And I think what lacks is vehicles for, for children um, to be able to engage and express that, right? We, had a, we did a, a hunger strike in D.C. and there was a bus that came from New Orleans. Um, they raised $4,000 um, and it was a bus of almost exclusively people who, families, individuals in deportation. And children, they did a, the way they raised the money is they had a meeting and people brought old stuff and sold it to each other, including the kids that brought toys and sold toys to each other. And they actually helped fundraise. And the kids were like, you know, there was a way where oftentimes you can just be like, oh, well, there's childcare, right? And, but they actually, they had, a, they had some skin in the game. You know what Absolutely. I mean? They, they had some skin in the game because they, they were impacted by this. So we are, ended up organizing a children's march in front of the White House. And then, you know, they, they brought beads from New Orleans and they were passing out beads and then a marching band kind of came and accompanied them. And then we did a speak out. And like they, there was a, like a lot of shame, a lot of anger, a lot of like, they were numb. And so there was a point where they got to, gave them the mic and it's like, whoever, whichever one of you wants to speak, speak, you know, speak your truth. And I think that's another, like another way to look at this is like, what are the ways in which we're creating multi, multi-generational spaces, mm -hmm. spaces for families as we define them as people, spaces for community to actually come together and bring children, bring young people to be able to actually have a vehicle. Because if, if we just get all of the theory and all of the this and we don't have anywhere to put it, it's also potentially very damaging, but I do agree that there's a need for that. And I think sometimes we're gonna have to fight for those spaces within institutions, but we have to also create those spaces within organizations and community. Thank you. So, I'd just like to close, just like to close by, with thanking each of you for being willing to struggle with some of the really big questions that were asked today and for be, being your brilliant and beautiful selves. And uh, thanks to everyone for engaging in this conversation. Um, we're gonna head out to lunch, right? Nope, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, 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 no,
artistic intervention. Um, today, you will see Complex Movements. Complex Movements is a Detroit-based artist and artist collective composed of graphic designer slash fine artist, Wesley Taylor, music producer slash filmmaker, Wajid, hip-hop lyricist slash organizer, Invincible, and creative technologist slash multimedia artist, Carlos Garcia. They develop interactive performance work, which you will experience today, and workshops that you can attend tomorrow that illuminate connections between complex science and social justice movements to support the transformation of communities. Right now, there'll be pe there are people passing out um, some flyers that have a tree on them. Feel free to grab one, grab a pen. We're gonna announce when they're ready to hand it out. Okay. And uh, their current project, Beware of the Dandelions, integrates elements of sci-fi gaming, hip-hop, techno, animation, and architecture, and is being co-produced by Sage Crump. Sage is co-director of Art is Change, which supports work to transform culture in the areas of economy, ecology, community, and creativity.